Welcome to the Bothell City Council meeting of December 17th, 2019. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, all council members are present except Council Member McAuliffe. Um, Meeting agenda approval, we've got a, a few changes we need to make tonight. Um, one of them is our, uh, we have an executive session we need to move up before consent because our um, outside uh, attorney is here. So we're gonna move, if everybody's okay, we're gonna move that up to after public comment. Everybody okay with that? Okay, is there any other, ch oh, that, oh, and I wanted to poll. Where is it? I need to pull the council protocol manual, AB 19-214. Is there any other changes to tonight's agenda? Deputy Mayor. I'd like to pull 19, AB 19-213. And I'd like to pull a, an item. AB 19. Go ahead. AB 19-217. Yeah. Okay, is there any other changes to tonight's agenda? Um, there was one other thing I was gonna do just because the public comment period, I was gonna move the city manager council committee reports to after visitor comment, is that okay? Everybody okay with that? Okay. All right, let's see if we can keep track of this. All right, so first on our agenda is the um, public engagement opportunities. There's none, good. All right. The next on the agenda is the special presentation of the recognition of uh, myself, uh, the outgoing mayor. <laughs> I believe you have the floor, city manager. Oh, I gotta come up there. On behalf of the City of Bothell, in recognition of your dedicated service on the Bothell City Council, vision to lead with integrity and transparency, your deep commitment to the Bothell community, and support of staff, we honor, we honor Andy Rayum, City Council member from January 2012 through 2016, and then mayor through January 2016 through 2019. And this is presented to you on behalf of all of us and we as staff thank you. We thank you for your support. We thank you for your vision. We thank you for taking Bothell in this new direction. And we're blessed and honored to be a part of your journey. Thank you for all you've done for us. Thank you. I left my notes for my speech up there, but, uh, don't but you it. guys are, don't give it okay, yet. There we go. You can't there. give it yet. <laughs> so this is a multi-part presentation, <laughs> surprise. So uh, let the record show, I'm Eric Murray, president of Cascadia College, and Kelly Snyder. This is University of Washington Bothell. And we also like to make a small presentation. Uh, ours isn't nicely lacquered and plaqued, <laughs> but we do have a picture and a frame, and you're gonna have an honor wall at home now. But uh, Mayor Rayom, Andy, uh, we wanna thank you for being a great friend to the campus. Uh, both institutions, Cascadia and Utah Bothell, uh, have felt that over the last few years, our relationship with the city has gotten better because of your leadership and the way the council has shaped and our opportunities to interact more, and that's largely because of your experience. Um, and no doubt because you're an alum of the University of Washington Bothell, that's really cool. I wish you were an alum of Cascadia College, but <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Um, but be, on behalf of Kelly and myself, as well as Chancellor Ye, we wanna present you with this plaque and also thank honor you. and thank you for everything you've done. And Kelly's gonna fill in the blanks. Thank you so much. Well, Andy, we've known each other many years and we've been through lots of things. And you know, you've been such a stalwart supporter of Uta Bothell. Um, of me and for Dr. Murray as well. And we couldn't be more proud of you as our alum. So we know that you have so many more things to come. We really uh, wish you all the very best and I know that you will come back and uh, share all of your knowledge and experience with all of our students on campus um, and do us proud. So thank you so much for all your support. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. 
Good thing I have a lot of wall space. This thing's huge. Uh, I really don't like being the center of attention, which might be surprising as the mayor of a city. But um, let's see here. I have a whole bunch of stuff I just jotted down before I got here because I had a hard time trying to pull together what happened over the last eight years. But I, um, I figured I'd start at the beginning and finish at the end. So um, one of the most common questions you get as an elected official is like, why did you do that? Like, why did you get involved with the city? Um, and I, I think it's a worthwhile story telling a lot of people, at least all of them have heard it, but um, what happened was I went to a council meeting uh, a couple years before I was elected. And I sat in the audience and I, I got up to give public comment. I remember I was super nervous. And I got up and I, and I told them that I was concerned. I was, I'm born and raised in Bothell, just so you guys know. Um, so I figured I had the right to get up and say something. So I, so I went up there and I said, you know, I'm really um, concerned about the uh, construction projects and that you guys aren't controlling all the mud when you rip all the trees out and the mud goes into the streams. And because I did that for work. It was a, a, the job I had at the time in a different city. And, uh, and I sat back down and, and a couple of the council members, we'll leave names out of it, started actually um, insulting me as a the member of the community getting up and saying my piece, like, hey, I think this is an issue you guys are missing or whatever, I wanna look at it. Um, and then the, a couple of the high level staff members were snickering. Um, I won't say who they were either. Um, but I remember just sitting there being like, who the hell are these people, you know? Why, why would you get to treat a, a resident like that when they got up to say something? So I, um, after that, the actual, this, not the ones that were snickering, but other staff members, the public works director at the time called me and had me come into their, his office, or it was a meeting room. And uh, they had this whole elaborate map of where they thought I drove to and from my work to my house. And they had my house on there and everything because they were trying to figure out what construction projects I was looking at. Um, needless to say, they hired me as uh, on the weekends to go out and look at these projects and report back to the engineering group so they could actually start enforcing the, the laws. So um, that's kind of how I got involved and it's kind of on an environmental spin so that, uh, so that was a big thing that, uh, the, the, for me in my career uh, here as well as in my personal, uh, well not personal, but my real career. There, I don't know if everybody knew that, but the mayor and the council members, they, this is a part-time deal. Uh, we have regularly full-time jobs. so. Um, I did that. I did environmental stuff uh, for a career at the time. So, anyway, so that's how I got involved. Um, I think since then, the the biggest the, I have a list of accomplishments, and the the biggest one really is the what I like to call the coup. Um, and the city manager that we have now, Jennifer, she, I always tell her she legitimized the coup. Um, but what we <laughs> sorry, um, what we did was pretty amazing. Uh, we we. We changed the council. Uh, we changed the dynamics of how the council interacts with the community. We changed the dynamics of how the council interacts with the staff. And really, what we have right now is super special. And it's not its not because of me. I mean, I was just a fraction of that. I was involved. I'll take some credit. But the, really, it was, it was all these people. It was the staff. It's staff we have now. Um, and it's and it's such a, an interesting thing because it's so fragile. And like one of the things that uh, we hired a consultant to talk to us about our, our group, and she said to me, and I've, it's just stuck with me, is that you know you want to come across the community as an effective team. An effective team as a council, effective team as the council and the, and the staff, and an effective team with the council and the community. And I, I feel like we're there right now, and it's fragile. It will change, and it will go back to, so, you know, there's a rotation to this thing, and I've seen it because I've worked in city government for 20 years. There's a cycle to it. and so. Enjoy what you guys have right now. I've, it's, I'm happy to leave on a high note, um, but you know, at some point the, the ride will come to an end. So get what you can done while you still have everybody all m rowing in the same direction. Um, some accomplishments, these are kind of the big ones for me. Um, the safe streets and sidewalks, you know, we had a, there was literally a point in time when I was on the council that it was the plan was to cut the entire road crew. So like snow plows, people that maintain the roads, gone. Um, so we went out to the community and said, this is a problem. They gave us funding. We actually added in sidewalks and fixing the roads to that levy. And that levy is the, responsible for all the sidewalk improvements and the road improvements you see now. And that we actually have snow plows and, and a, a road maintenance crew. Uh, public safety improvements, that's something that the community did with us and improved a, a bond that really increased our uh, police force and our fire services. Uh, and also included two fire stations that we're designing and building now. Um, 
Fitzgerald. That was one of the ones that <laughs> everybody up there remembers that one. Um, that was one of those deals that um, somebody told me one time, I think they were a family law attorney, that if you have both parties leave the room really mad, you made the right decision. And that was one of those decisions where really nobody was happy, um, but ultimately I think we made the right decision. Uh, it's, it's a sub area, sorry, Fitzgerald's a sub area that we changed the zoning. Um, the environmental presence, I put at Bothell, well, not just me, but I, I did work um, pretty hard on regional issues around environmental issues. I was the Wire 8 Salmon Recovery Council Chair. Um, I really, I, I knew stormwater, which was weird for a, a salmon recovery person. So I did a lot to help educate the uh, elected officials at the state level as well as uh, staff in both, uh, in both arenas. So they kind of understood like they, they actually, stormwater flows to streams. And so um, that was a big deal for me. Um, a big one is to create a place of warmth and, and a welcoming here at the city council. Like I said in my, opening there, uh, how I got involved. That was something that I just absolutely would not gonna, I wasn't gonna tolerate as a mayor. I wanna make sure that people were welcomed here and that the council was uh, respectful to each other. Uh, this this council has been fantastic about it, but past councils, they would just attack each other and it was just, you just left with a knot in your stomach at the end of the night and I think all of us did. Uh, preserving the Wayne Golf Course, that was a big deal. I'm looking at this council member McNeil up there. Um, I had a part in that, not a huge part, but I definitely had a part in it. Uh, preserving the North Creek Forest, the downtown revitalization. Um, you know, a lot of people were concerned when we did say, like, we're, we're going to take the city in a new direction. People were very concerned, like, well, what do you mean? Does that mean you're going to stop the downtown revitalization? And we didn't. Uh, that was part of the plan was to continue uh, the revitalization. Uh, we cleaned up a lot of dirty dirt. I went to the mayor meetings a lot, and that, you know, we report out what each city's doing, and that's basically my standard answer was the first thing, because a lot of the dirt was contaminated by the two uh, state routes that were here for a century. So um, we're still cleaning them up. And that leaves me with my thank yous. <laughs> Sorry. Um, my first thank yous to my kids. I know I've been doing for it. <laughs> Uh, okay, sorry. Um, um, my kids sacrificed a ton. I mean, it was a, a great, a, a complete correlation between my time spent here and time taken away from them. But I hope they, uh, I hope they get something out of it as, as adults. So, uh, my mom, huge support. Uh, my dad, my dad's a staunch Republican, so we had very interesting conversations the day after council meetings <laughs> on my way into work. I, I always appreciated him now. Um, there, he kept me balanced, let's put it that way. Um, the, the city council, you know, I learned a lot from you guys. Um, I'm not a born leader, I don't, nobody ever is, but you know, you guys really were good people to me uh, leading the council and I, I couldn't have been successful without you guys. Uh, the director's team, leadership team, um, night and day difference between who you are, who's sitting there now, and who was here at the beginning. Um, I learned a lot. Just every interaction I ever had with you guys was a valuable moment for me. So, um, and then I'm gonna start crying again about Jennifer. So I'm not gonna say anything. <laughs> I'm gonna make her cry to you. So we'll both leave it at that. Um, but Jennifer's been a huge rock in my life, um, a huge mentor to me, as well as I know the leadership team feels the same way. We did a performance evaluation with for Jennifer and I, I have the same sentiment that you guys do about it, uh, about Jennifer. So I hope she stays here for the remainder of her career and is treated well and, and enjoys it because we're really lucky to have a, an executive like Jennifer um, running our city. So my past, I have just a very few passing thoughts, I guess. The um, last thing here is that, you know, like I said, we have something really special here. It's fragile. Please take care of it. I did the best I could to take care of it, but carry it forward. Um, vote with your heart. I know a lot of you have already heard me say that a lot of times, but <coughs> that's uh, that's probably the most important thing because if you, if you don't do that, I don't know what's going to happen to you when you get off council, but it's not pretty if you don't uh, do what you think is right as a council member just based on what the community needs. So that's my comments. Thank you. Appreciate the time.
one. Okay. So I think um, I do have a, s a special guest that wanted to say something. Is he still? You want, you into it? You want to do it? All right. Aiden Rayum would like to have a moment of personal privilege. Well, I just want to say thank you, Dad, for going through the hard times and the easy times through the years and just sticking with it and always having a fun time with me and my brother Drew here. Thank you. Go Hawks. All right. Moving on. Oh, no, no you're not going to let me go. Deputy Mayor. I always have to go first. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say, enjoy having your private life back and know that you have made a positive difference in the trajectory of Bothell's history. Most Bothell residents will never know your sacrifices, maybe not even your name, but they will benefit from your leadership for years to come. We're going down there, there we go. Council Member Zorn, I knew this was gonna happen. Oh yeah, we're going there, and I'm, we're going three pages worth, so I'm just telling you, it's big font, so. Okay, and this is, this is directed to Andy. So Andy, council member, mayor, a real friend of Bothell, thank you. I remember the first time I met you. You were doorbelling, and my husband gave you a very tough grilling. You kept your composure and your wits about you, but it was nothing compared to what your next four years would be like. You were tolerated, shut down, talked over, lectured ad nauseum, marginalized without fail every time council met. You may not have heard, been heard on the dais, but you were heard from the dais. The people of Bothell grew to respect so much about you. You may not have realized it at the time, but as citizens had the temerity to speak up, frequently face the same treatment you became our hero. You, with a few other heroes on the dais at that time, modeled a civil conscience, a character that said it would not match disrespect with dis disrespect. You stood by your God-given intellect, experience, insights, and ethics, and I thank you for that. You've modeled that even though there may be a personality conflict, you have always esteemed the personhood of, the, of an individual. Conflict is hard and often inevitable, but in a healthy community, it will never be where the same people are always walking away happy and a different group that is always taking it in the chops. Conflict is an opportunity to be giving so that no group, one group, is always doing the taking. Where, to quote our current mayor, a good decision is where everyone is upset over something not totally going their way, which I confess, I don't totally get all the time, so thank you. As a mayor, you still remind all of us we are just one of seven votes. You insist that we vote with our heart. And if one of us has chafed or irritated you, we have been none the wiser. As this outstanding group of seven with hearts compelled for the best of Bothell has waded through many decisions, you have been a constant. You've brought wisdom, real wisdom, backed by salient experience and knowledge. You think of the immediate cause and effect of our decisions as well as what that may mean down the road. And I think we give props to your dad for helping you with that. You know where every tax, tax dollar has, that every tax dollar has to be earned by someone calling the city home or work. You've brought life back to the dais. Even the most burdened people sitting in the chambers find your moderating fair and encouraging. Thank you for making the council chambers a community of action, not hostility. We are going to sorely miss your presence here and your measured salting of humor. You've set a high bar, not a perfect bar, but it's going to be a high one for anyone sitting in your chair. You are leaving some mighty big shoes to fill and I have one last favor. It's one that I ask of everyone. Don't be a stranger hold our feet to the fire. And I'm grateful to Logan and Aiden and Drew for sharing you these eight years. So to you, dear young men of Andes, thank you. Merry Christmas and may 2020 bring you good adventures.
nicest thing anybody ever said about me. <laughs> Councilmember Agnew. And now for something completely different. <laughs> I just want to tell you how much I respect you and admire you. Uh, I've been with you for your entire tenure up here. Uh, I, I was with the bad times, I'm with the good times. You've always been the rock up here. Uh, I tried to figure, what, what kind of name can I give you? And I, I don't know, but there's something that says, a person who is admired or idolized for courage, outstanding achievements, or noble qualities. And I think that kind of fits you. Uh, I've known a lot of heroes in my life, and you're gonna be one of them. Thank you very much for everything. Been a lot of great things said already, and uh, Gene, that was a great, you know, uh, three pages that you had. <laughs> um, but just thank you very much for making my two years here uh, easy on me. You know, I, I look forward coming to these meetings every night. Uh, I consider the other six council members friends on here. Uh, I think that was a real desire of yours to be, you know, have a, a civil, working, you know, enjoyable place for us, and you really carried that through, and you set the bar, you set the bar high for me for what my experience is on council, and I just hope to continue this for my next two years. And like Gene said, don't be a stranger, you know, you know, call us up, tell us when we're, you know, screwing up, and you know, thanks. Thanks so much. Got to clap for Liam. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Councilmember Rolson. And the closer, Councilmember um, McNeil. Um, I'm going to try to keep it from the heart. Um, sorry. When I met you five and a half years ago, I didn't know you. Today, I can show you my brother. The journey that we've gone on together will last a lifetime. You've taught me something as a, an elected leader that we can always vote from the heart and always make decisions that are in the best interest of our community. And with today's political climate, today, I feel like I'm at home because of all the leadership that you've showed me and this community. A lot of times we hear bad things said about us, but we know behind the scenes where the heart's at and where your heart's at and where your heart's been. And it's always been home here in Bothell. And for that, I love you as a brother, as a friend, as a father of children. I understand the sacrifices that we go through. As elected leaders, I understand the sacrifices that we go through. But what you've done here, Andy, will last a lifetime in perpetuity. And you know, we can say we saved the Wayne Golf Course, we could say we've done Fitzgerald, we could say we've done all these things, but the thing we have done is change the trajectory, change the trajectory of the city of Bothell and the way it's run. And the staff that's been put in place, the leadership that we have today, all cities, all cities, and you know I serve on a lot of community, a lot of committees across this region, all cities are looking at Bothell for the leadership that you've brought to this community and what it means regionally that can be done. And in the community, you might not realize this, but um, the things that Andy Rayum has done for the city of Bothell, um, every city across Washington state recognizes it. I see it, I serve on many regional committees, and they always talk about the level of leadership that we have here, uh, the things that happened after the fire, all, all the things that you've done. I, I, you know, we can say all these magical words, but, um, I can tell you, when I look out in this crowd and I see the kids, they're the ones who are going to reap the rewards of what you've done for many, many years to come, and future generations will. So from the bottom of my heart, um, thank you for always allowing me um, uh, to be the person that I wanted to be as an elected official. Thank you for believing in me um, and mentoring me uh, to become the person I am today on this council. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, all of you guys. All right, moving on. Uh, oh, wait, we're supposed to take a break, aren't we? <laughs> My bad. All right, so we're going to have cake. Uh, it's, uh, let's say it's about 6.30. We'll, be, we'll come back at uh, 6.50. Sound good? All right, 6.50.
All right, city council is back from um, cake, and now we're on to uh, visitor. Con oh, I don't have my little my last time reading this. Looking forward to it. Okay, now we're in the public comment period. Each person addressing the council will give his or her name in an audible tone of voice for the record. And unless the council grants further time, shall limit the address to three minutes. No person other than the council and the person having the floor will be permitted to enter into any discussion either directly or through the member of the council without the permission of the mayor. And I have one sign up sheet. Pat Sheehan, would you come up to the dais? Or I'm sorry, the podium? My name is Patrick Sheehan. You're able to hear me all right. Uh, first, thanks for your time, and the rest of you, thank you for your time. Um, I'm a little bit out of my element. I'm an IT guy. I'm good at right-clicking and double-clicking. Not exactly this environment. But the reason I'm here today is to ask you for your help. I run into a discrepancy with some of your engineers over my property. <sighs> I don't know how much detail I should go into here, but in the past couple of days, I ran across further document that boasts um, the claim I'm making that you're, the city's come in here and it's actually taken a portion of my property um, that's not the city's and it's, they don't have an easement, although they think they do. But I'm here to ask for help and the type of help I need is I need more time. I only found out about this two weeks ago when I found someone in my front yard digging a hole, putting up a no parking sign in front of my house. And I'm like, what's going on? So I've dug into this a lot over the past two weeks and um, I feel extremely confident. Matter of fact, I can assure you, I have documentation that proves there was an easement, but the easement is no longer there and it's my property and you guys are coming in and taking it. <clears throat> I've been trying to find a lawyer to help me with this, but I can't even get in front of a lawyer until the second week of next year because the, the lawyers you need are very specialized for this type of a, um, litigation. And so that's what I'm asking for is to get a little more a bit more time for me to present my case so I don't lose my property. Um, that's what I'm asking for. I'm not certain what else I should say at this point. That's okay. So we we just sit up here and watch people then when they when they talk but, but, but we could uh city manager do you have somebody you can put them in contact with or yes i'll give them my card and then um, we'll communicate with you very good thank you all right yep you're welcome that's the only sign up sheet i have does anybody else want to provide public comment go once twice okay moving on to city manager council committee reports is there any you good no nope. So we have an item on the agenda under this. Is, is, oh, look is at that, that the one? Local consent for refugee settlement efforts in Washington State? Correct. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I don't think we coordinated very well on this. We did not, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so in your packet, you have a letter from the uh, from a State Department requesting um, for uh, support from the Council for Local Consent for Refugee Resettlement um, for your consideration. The, just so Council understands, the challenge that we're having with this is it's a request from the state. We've had no briefing from the state. We've had no contact with the state. This is just a letter that was received. Staff tried to collect some information, but we are in no way subject matter experts. We haven't analyzed this. Um, the letter came in. We recognize that there's a deadline to respond, and we thought that we would bring it before council for at least some, if, if you don't want to send the letter, some additional direction. We're not really sure sort of what your, what your thoughts are about this. And, and so again, not being sub subject matter experts, we're not able to present you any information or have any kind of um, dialogue or information for you. This big thick thing here? Yes. So the, the letter is what came and then staff tried to compile some additional information for you. Uh, Councilmember Zern? Just a couple of questions because I went through this, not line by line. I got the impression that this was a continuance of what's been, 
but I don't know if it's an accurate in t uh, impression. Is it a continuance of how we've been managing immigrants up to 2019? There's an executive order at the federal level that came down that asked for the, these letters basically from the state and then also from the local level. So that's a new requirement is having this official sort of documentation. Um, they've already been placing refugees in areas um, from the state. They have eight different places that they go and those are the listed nonprofits that are in there. And then after that, they try to place them in cities around. So the new requirement is that this letter has to be in for the city of Bothell to be that place where eventually the refugees go. So question, what if we miss the deadline so we can chew on it some more? Do we know what the consequences if we miss the deadline? They will not be able to place uh, refugees here. Um, I'm not sure if the deadline is a hard and fast um, or if whenever they get the letter from us, then they could again place refugees. There's no communication on exactly how or how this is working. Right. I, 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 my personal opinion, can I give an opinion on this? It, it, it is that if this is just a, a continuing, what, continuing what we've been doing um, and it's an integrating into the community and there's community support, then there's no, then I would no, have no issues with it. But if we were to become a pocket where we would, the city would be a, the, a spot where there was a heavy density and there was not that family, I realize that there's not gonna be a family connection all the time, but we were to become, because you hear about that, there's some communities where there's just a whole migra migration of people that come in and settle in a community. And right now, I mean, being protective of the people of Bothell, right now we're just having a hard time having housing for our norm, normal flow of people coming through Bothell. So if it's if it's a continuation of what's been going on in the past, I don't have a problem with that. But if it's talking if we're talking about, you know, several hundred people coming in and trying to find a place in Bothell from what it used what from what it's historically been, then that gives me pause and I want to know how that's going to be managed. As I understand it is your your first um, thought on that, which is that it's just continuing what has been happening in the past. So when refugees come to the state, they'll again, they'll go to those eight um, agencies that are listed in the packet first and foremost to get sort of initially settled. Mm -hmm. And then sort of the long term, they find housing within the entire state. And so if they have family here, for instance, then they may be looking at Bothell, but this is not um, anything additional. Okay, all right, and th and that that's been your that's been really obvious as you've gone through this. That's the communication your impression? that we've received from the state okay. agency. All right, thank you. Does anybody else have an opinion? I guess I can weigh in. I don't like last minute things like this. Of course, I need the federal government, so I'm not really interested in signing it. But if others are, when we'll, we'll do it, Deputy Mayor. So as I read it, it says, as the, state, as the Washington State Refugee Coordinator, my goal is to ensure that all localities that have participated in initial refugee resettlement in the past can and will be eligible to, to continue that participation in the future. It sounds to me as though it's something we already do. So I would be in favor of signing. One of the options could be that we communicate back, if council's not ready to make a decision tonight, that we communicate back um, before the deadline that council needs more time to consider, and maybe we could have a state representative come and provide you with more information. Um, that may be an option, but I don't know if that then nullifies, if, we, if, if there isn't a positive action, I, I just, we just don't know enough. It, the timing was so short and I didn't, I didn't feel comfortable missing the deadline and not having to be able to bring it to council, but we, again, just didn't have time to um, be able to really do the background research. So it's, we're sort of in an uncomfortable position and I apologize for that. But we could, we could certainly try that, to communicate back, ask for a little extension and try to get some additional information and a representative to come and provide some more information. Let's go down the line here. Councilor Agnew, sign it or don't sign it now? Well, if, if I read this correctly, Seattle, SeaTac, Kent, Tacoma, Vancouver, Spokane, Kennewick uh, are, uh, are all receiving refugees at this point in time. 
uh, were not. Uh, and I think I read in here somewhere that there's about 2,000 that have been. <laughs> I'd still like a little bit more information. Uh, reading this and, and hearing what I'm hearing, we're not going to be accepting refugees if we don't sign it. Uh, but I would like some more information on this. Councilmember McNeil. Sure. Councilmember Olson. I'd like more information as well. More information, please. Okay, we're not signing it. All right, moving on. Is there any other council committee reports? Seeing none. Okay, so we need to go into executive session four. Sorry, I gotta scroll down. Oh, scrolled past. Potential litigation pursuant to RCW 4230-1101-I. In about 15 minutes, and we can extend if necessary. Okay, so we'll be in executive session for 15 minutes uh, to 7.16.
back from executive session. We are on to the consent agenda. So we have a few items pulled. So I need a motion to approve the remainder of the consent agenda minus AB 19-213, AB 19-214, and AB dash, I'm sorry, AB 19-217. So moved. Sorry, moved by the deputy mayor, second by Councilmember McNeil. Any discussion on the motion? See none, please vote. And it passes unanimously with Councilmember McCullough, if absent, excused. We're on to, oh, sorry, so we gotta pick these up. So uh, the first item is AB 19-213, construction contract with uh, Weiser Construction Incorporated, Wexler Soil Remediation Department of Commerce grant agreement and related fund funding. I pulled it for the city attorney. Thank you. So if you look at, um, it is on page 27 of 446 in your packet. Um, it is attachment two to that agenda bill. Um, it is an ordinance and there's a small typo. If you read through the ordinances as an ordinance of the city of Bothell, Washington, authoring, authorizing an interfund loan in the amount of one and one quarter million dollars, but then in parentheses, it's actually $1,115,000. And so the city is asking for an amendment of that ordinance uh, so that it will read um, an ordinance of the city of Bothell, Washington, authorizing an interfund loan, loan in the amount of $1,115,000 from the storm and surface water fund. Deputy Mayor, do you want to make a motion then, or do you want us to do it? I want to make a motion, but I didn't follow. I couldn't find the page fast enough. I'm so sorry. That's fine. Let's go back. So it's on again. On Can we just stay to approve with okay. the amended uh, <laughs> agreement, which is presented to the mayor? Sure. Okay. That works for you. That works for me. Okay. I move whatever was presented to the mayor. Second. All right. It's moved and seconded to approve the. Where are we? Sorry. Construction contract with Weiser Construction Incorporated, Wexler Soil Remediation Department of Commerce grant agreement and related funding with the uh, Scribner's error corrected in the paper copy I have at the dais. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, please vote. That passes unanimously with Councilmember McAuliffe, absent excused. Uh, next one pulled is the 19-214 resolution updating the City Council Protocol Manual. And I had one change that I, of course, don't have right handy. Uh, Councilmember Zorns, did you have a couple of changes you were interested in seeing too? Uh, yep. Are you good? Okay. Will you, will you do your questions first while I look up my Okay, sure. This, issue. this may be... Um, one of the uh, comments that you had was uh, public will not be taken. My question was on page 36 of our agenda packet. No, page 113 of our agenda packet. And it's under an underlying section where it says public comment. It's the, sorry, it's like the almost fourth paragraph up from the bottom and the last sentence. Public comment will not be taken on items that the council has previously considered in a public hearing. And so my question is, are those items that where we're waiting for council to vote on and the hearing's been closed or is that all items total? And so the intent behind that was um, whenever we're doing a public hearing, we wanna make sure there's an established record. And so we always invite the public to comment during the public hearing portion of it. And so I think the intent behind the language was, was to uh, encourage the public to comment topically during a public hearing rather than generally at the visitor comment. I do understand that because you offer a visitor comment period, people are allowed to use three minutes to say whatever right. they want. Um, and so if you wanna take out that last line about public comment will not be taken on items, items that the council has previously considered in a public hearing, you're free to do so. Or can we just rephrase it on items waiting for uh, where public comment has been closed but the council's waiting to needing to vote on it? Is that... 
is that too much? I think it might be easier words. just to remove it, honestly. Okay, do um, it. All right. And that way, it's it, we can still always let the public know that when they're speaking at a public hearing on a particular topic, okay. if they want to be part of the record, they need to speak during that process, not okay. user comment period. Whatever's easiest. Yeah. But, but yeah, allowing people to comment is a good thing. And then my my other question is on back two pages on page 111. There's it's there's a there's a whole bunch of bullet points on request up about a I don't know a quarter of the way up from the bottom of the page. Request for items for consideration on the projected agenda may be made by any one of the following methods, and it's struck out council consensus by two council members, by council committee, by the mayor, by advisory board, via written citizen request. And my question is why? Uh, you made this decision during a goal setting or during a um, council team building workshop on how the projected agenda can be more effectively used. Um, and, and the discussion was that it would come up during the quarterly um, scorecard items that would then go on the projected agenda. So so these parties so these parties could do that during our our scorecard but is that what you're saying? Sure, but okay. That was the consensus that happened during that workshop was how to better sort of target additional work, additional items the projected agenda for the council was sort of it was sort of becoming this running list of was it didn't really have direction and it didn't really have timing and it was just sort of becoming this this parking lot of of thoughts or ideas and so the idea was that there would be more discussion by and to get direction of the majority of the council so on a quarterly basis when staff brings the scorecard on the scorecard then to say oh I have something that I would like to put on a projected agenda to look at what everyone's working on and decide if there was capacity to do that, whether you wanted to take something off the scorecard and add that, okay. and, and that's where that came about. Okay. There's always the opportunity for the community to <coughs> communicate with the council and ask for things, but it was it was sort of funneling how things got on the projected agenda. Okay, now, I was wondering if that's what was going on, but you know, so many pages and such a short weekend. So um, can I continue or are you ready to go? Mayor. You covered, you covered the one thing I had on page uh, 36. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. No, that's good. Okay. Uh, can I ask one more question? Um, no. Just no. Kidding. Okay. No, Go that's ahead. fine. Keep going. Keep going. That's fine. No, it's all under, it's all under, uh, it's great. I'm good. You're good? Those were the two big ones. All right. Deputy Mayor. <laughs> so I had a question on page 91 on cause for dismissal. Um, it reads sort of funny, and I'm not sure um, if it reads or if it's the intent is, is what it sounds like. Um, members, so boards and commission members may be dismissed from service for failure to attend meetings, three unexcused absences, or failure to complete OPMA PRA training pursuant to RCW 42.30.42.56 within 90 days of appointment. Members may also be dismissed for using personal devices to conduct city business and or failure to use city email accounts. And I'm, I'm not quite understanding the personal devices because our boards and commission members don't get city issued devices, so it's confusing to me. I'm not sure what the intent is. I, I could change that line to, um, you're right, they don't get devices. We could say using personal email accounts. Yes, that makes sense so to me. I will me. change that. Yeah, because otherwise it sounds like they're not allowed to use their personal computers. Yeah, sorry. No worries. Thank you. All right. Any other changes, requests? So I just had kind of one kind of overarching comment. There was in the agenda memo, it said just look to page 34 and 35, but there was changes on 36, and there was another change like it was in red on a different part of it. So I wasn't really sure, and I just, especially as a new council member coming in, we might want to try to uniform how we do edits and or additions and deletions, uh, kind of the common practices, bold and underline for new stuff, and then cross out all caps for stuff that we're, we're taking out. And I noticed it kind of in this document as well as there's something else in the agenda, and it was just, I just thought I'd just bring it up. That might be a good idea to try to get all the departments doing it the same so that a new council member coming in isn't like, what's going on here? They can't see the changes um, as easily. So just have, having a uniform way that we show the changes, I think it would be pretty helpful. Um, okay, so is there a motion? 
I move to approve the res approve the resolution adopting updates to the city council protocol manual with <laughs> changes discussed. <laughs> Can I do that? Second. That worked. <laughs> okay. She's Moved by the deputy mayor, back. seconded by, uh, let's get one to Councilmember Agnew. Any discussions on the motion? Seeing none, place your vote. It passes uh, one, two, three, four, five in the affirmative, and Councilmember Zorns and Councilmember Olson didn't vote for some reason. We did. All right, passes unanimously. Uh, next on the agenda, is that all the ones we pulled? Nope, there's one more. AB 19 217, resolution establishing stay out of drug area, repealing one prohibited area, and renewing an existing prohibited area. And that was Councilmember Zorns. So I guess I'm putting our attorney up on the. Uh, Q&A for this. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing is some part of my reason for pulling this is a lot of the people of Bothell, and they're all riveted to their televisions tonight, so um, don't know of sodas. Mm -hmm. And we, and, and our, mainly our police and our emergency are, these are highly focused areas because there's some high traffic going on right. that's part of protecting them mm -hmm. and part of protecting so I was hoping that you could comment to that for, for people who don't know what soda is and then I have a question okay yeah so a, a soda area is a stay out of drug area and so essentially um, the police as they are out patrolling and engaging citizens uh, and residents they will see patterns um, in certain areas that there are certain types of conduct often with drug use um, often people passed out in their cars, um, and those are places where drug uh, people who use drugs congregate in order to sell drugs, use drugs, that type of situation. Um, and so the police have noticed that, and then through their affidavits that are presented as part of this item tonight, they then let the city council know where those areas are concentrated at so that we can um, essentially have another layer of defense so that as someone is then picked up for engaging in drug activity in that area, the court then would have the authority to issue a, a, so, um, a stay out of drug area order, essentially prohibiting them during the pendency of the case and while they're on probation from returning to that area of high drug activity. Um, so the resolution that we have tonight is one that we do every two years to either establish, disestablish, or reestablish areas. Um, and in this case tonight, we are removing one area because the um, placement of the soda or the, of the creation of that soda area, stay out of drug area, um, has resulted in less criminal activity in that area. And one of the things that if we're going to control where people can and cannot go, there needs to be a basis for it. And so because there isn't the level of drug activity that used to be there, we no longer have the basis for continuing to deem it a stay out of drug area. So that's why we've removed that. The others, we're simply asking for you to reaff uh, reaffirm that they are indeed valid areas. I believe the affidavits will um, give you the information you need in order to make that decision, and then we're adding one additional um, soda area, and that's the Home Depot area. Okay, thank you. You answered my question. Okay. So, shall I make a motion? Hold on, Councilmember Zorns. Councilmember McAuliffe. Oh, sorry, thank you. We're removing one area and, add, and adding one. But my question is this if you remove it, is there any history of then, does it become active again? There's always that potential. But as we're saying, when you when the court is trying to exercise its authority over where people can and cannot go, um, there's case law where a judge a long time ago said you have to leave the county. You don't have the authority to kick someone out of the county. And so if you're going to control their movement, you have to have a legitimate basis for it. In this case, because there's no longer that level of drug activity mm. in that area, we mm. no longer have the grounds to control whether people go in or out of that area. Right, but do we have any history of once we remove it, then does it come we, back? This, uh, to my knowledge, this is the first time we've removed a, a okay. area. So, so we'll have some history. We'll have, we'll, we will have some history, and hopefully um, it's become a less popular area to hang out and continues to remain that way. I would suspect that they just moved to other areas. That's why we're adding another soda area tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Customer Zorns. Let's 
see. I move that we adopt the attached resolu resolution establishing and renewing the prohibited areas related to areas of drug activity and repealing one soda re zone. Second. Moved by Councilman Resort, second by the Deputy Mayor to adopt the attached resolution establishing and renewed and renewing prohibited areas related to uh, areas of drug activity and repealing one soda zone. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, please your vote. We're waiting for a vote. Uh, passes unanimously. We're on to um, public hearing AB 19-219. It's a continuation of a public hearing of action on the 2019 plan and code amendments. Um, we're just going to continue the same. We'll make a motion to continue, but we do have somebody here that wants to provide public comment. Um, so we'll provide that opportunity. I don't think there's any staff. There's no staff report to give. Okay. Uh, Polly Lea. Is that right? Okay, sorry. I'll just give your name for the record. Uh, good evening. My name is Ray Liao, and I apparently have bad handwriting. Um, I'm, a, I'm actually an attorney with the uh, on behalf of the Canyon Park uh, Business Center Owners Association, and I'm here to speak briefly with respect to the minimum density proposal that is directly impacting the business centers. So, as indicated in your agenda bill, uh, the Owners Association has filed a SEPA appeal of the, term, the termination of non-significance for this proposal. It just basically means we disagree with the environmental review that's been done to date on this proposal. So while, uh, as also noted in your agenda, Bill, while we are working with the city and hope to reach a resolution on this, uh, before that occurs, either before your hearing examiner or through settlement, uh, the city council can't move forward on these comp plan uh, proposals um, through legislative action. Um, it, we also just wanted to note that we agree with, I think, a statement in the agenda bill that if the council doesn't take action to adopt those in this calendar year, um, you will be precluded from addressing those until your next 2020 comp plan cycle. So um, the owners association, just to be clear, we actually don't oppose the proposal to increase density in the park. We'd like a few tweaks, but we're generally in support of it. The concerns that we have are the environmental impacts on the um, private network of roads within the business center. and the um, lack of analysis that we think has been, been done to date with regards to the impacts of increased density within the park system. This is particularly alarming because there are three significant proposals by public agencies very much on the horizon, one being the city's interest in um, continuing the sub-area planning process um, given the regional growth designation for this area, the second being WashDOT's plan to um, uh, construct express toll lanes right into the park, the third being Sound Transit's design to potentially build the bus barn in this facility. So when you put all those together, um, the impacts uh, to our road network are significant. And we don't think that um, collectively um, any of the three agencies, including the city, are um, adequately addressing it or have addressed it at this point in time. So. Um, we believe there's a path forward to resolve this um, uh, through, the, um, through our settlement discussions. Um, one is to ensure that the city does adequate traffic analysis related to the desired growth. The second is to come up with a clear plan for dedication of those roads and acceptance by the city. So as I've mentioned, these are private roads, which means the city does not have the ability at this point in time to regulate that network of roads. So public safety, your police force can't do regular patrols, and this is significantly concerning given that residential development is underway within the park. You also can't um, legislate or regulate uh, traffic safety or mitigation impacts for the increased volume or impacts to the roadbeds. Your ability to regulate that literally stops at our door. And we think that given the planned growth and the current growth that's happening within the business center, it's, it is time to start the process immediately for, for um, converting these to public roads. So with that, uh, we look forward to continuing to work with staff and um, uh, thank you for the time to comment this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Polly. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> is there anybody else that wants to provide public comment? So I got to get a couple last blows in. It's almost over. Anybody? Nope. We're good. Okay. Is there a motion? Uh, yeah, I'd like to uh, make a motion to extend to January 21st to get some additional information. Extend the hearing. Yes. Second. Okay. So it's been moved a second to extend the hearing till January 21st. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none. Place your vote. Oh, not yet. When the clerk's ready.
And that passes unanimously. We're on to contracts, AB 19-220, amendment number one, to the interlocal agreement between Snohomish County and the city of Bothell on an excise tax applied to Snohomish County hotels located in Bothell. And we have Ms. McGee. Thank you, Mayor, Deputy Mayor and Council. Um, my name is Danae McGee. I'm the Tourism Manager for the City of Bothell. I'm here tonight to talk about two interlocal agreements, or ILAs is the acronym that I'll be using from here on out. Um, both ILAs are between the City of Bothell and Snohomish County. Uh, both affect tourism and do not affect the city's general fund. And both are either a tax or an assessment collected on overnight stays at Bothell hotels located in Snohomish County. The first um, that I'll talk about is the excise tax ILA. As I mentioned before, there is no impact on the city's general fund, but it would affect the tourism, the Bothell tourism budget by 75% per year if this ILA is not adopted. That's approximately $300,000 used for tourism promotion. And examples of how we are currently using those funds is for the Begin at Bothell brand and new website. Uh, background on this ILA, um, the, this ILA has been in effect since 2003. And prior to that, Snohomish County collected the full 4% of the excise tax on hotel night stays at Bothell Hotels in Snohomish County. With this ILA, 2% of the 4% excise tax is used for the Snohomish County Tourism Program and the other 2% for the Bothell Tourism Program. Um, and I'd like to add, this was a very generous gesture by Snohomish County back in 2003 to relinquish two of the 4% that they had been receiving. If this ILA is not passed, Snohomish County will collect the full 4% as they collected prior to this ILA going into effect back in 2003. Um, I'm here tonight because the current ILA is set to expire um, December 31st of this, ye of this year. Um, for discussion tonight, um, I'd like to add that um, currently the ILA is set to expire every five years, but um, we have an amendment to the ILA requesting that um, we extend it to 10 years. Um, we feel that this is the best plan to ensure the success of both programs. But other than that, everything remains the same. 2% will go to Snohomish County for tourism promotion. The other two will go to uh, Bothell Tourism Program for promotion. And that said, I can take any questions now if you have any. Any questions? No. Nope. Is there a motion? Thank you. Uh -huh. I think we're good. Okay. Is there a motion? Um, Oh, and there you go. Okay. Councilmember, Mc, you need to hit your button to talk on the microphone. There you go. Okay, thank you. I would just like to make a comment that I am very familiar with the with the tax that we have, the excise tax, and I'm very impressed that Snohomish County has decided in 2003 that we can all share in this because it's very important for our tourism program. And um, I just want to comment how important it is that we do renew this and go for the 10-year cycle and that we appreciate Snohomish County's contribution to this. Thank you. Thank you. All right, is there a motion? So I, <laughs> I move All right. approve and authorize the city manager to execute amendment number one of the interlocal agreement for tourism promotion funded by special excise tax and lodging. Second. All right, it's been moved by the deputy mayor, second by Council Member Agnew to approve the, and, I'm sorry, approve and authorize the city manager to execute the amendment number one of the interlocal agreement for tourism promotion funded by special excise tax on lodging. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, place your vote. <laughs> and it passes unanimously. Flying right along. We are on. AB 19-221, amendment number one to the interlocal agreement establishing a tourism promotion area, increasing the assessment from $1 per night visit at Snohomish County Hotels to $2 per night visit, and I'll bet we still have Ms. McGee. There you go. Yeah. Go for All right. Um, so the tourism promotion area assessment, and I'll be using the acronym TPA now, um, 
again, it has no impact on the city's general fund, um, but unlike the excise tax, um, this has no impact on the Bothell Tourism Program. Um, the total assessment collected goes entirely to Snohomish County. In 2017, the TPA Advisory Board for Snohomish County requested the county consider increasing the assessment from the $1 currently in place to the maximum $2 per room night allowed by RCW. Um, this, that is why Snohomish County is, staff is here tonight. Um, they'll be making this request. Um, before I do introduce Rich, though, I'd like to comment that um, staff back in August uh, approached the um, hotels in Snohomish County, Bothell-based Snohomish County hotels, um, uh, doing a, requesting a, they sign us, they fill out a survey, um, asking questions about how they felt about this tax or assessment. And based on the lack of feedback that we received, um, and and also based on the fact that um, LTAC. Uh, unanimously voted um, to encourage council to pass this assessment um, or this ILA. Um, staff too is requesting that that, that be done. Um, and that would be um, adopting amendment number one to the ILA, increasing the TPA assessment from $1 to the maximum $2 per night allowed per RCW. Um, I'd now like to introduce uh, Rich Hubner. He is the Tourism Promotion Coordinator for Snohomish County Parks, Recreation, and Tourism Department. And he'll be going into further detail regarding, regarding this request. So um, I'm gonna turn this over to Rich now. Thank you very much, Danae. Uh, Mayor Ayum, Deputy Mayor uh, and, and Council, thank you very much for the opportunity to address you tonight. Uh, for the record, uh, again, Rich Hebner, Tourism Promotion Coordinator from Snohomish County. Um, I'm here on behalf tonight of, of our department, uh, Director Tom Tigan. Tonight's his 36th wedding anniversary, so I'm sure you all can understand why I'm here in his stead. Uh, but just to give you all a, a, a very brief background, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have as well. Uh, just a, a background on the request to increase the, um, the assessment, that, as Danae mentioned, that came from our advisory board and, and where the intent of, of that increase um, it, it started and, and kind of some of the, the windy road uh, that we, we went to to get to where we are. Uh, so the, the lodging industry of Snohomish County uh, petitioned the, count, the county council to establish the TPA back in 2010 and since then has served as a grant fund for tourism promotion, events, uh, programmatic marketing promotions uh, to increase tourism as a whole to Snohomish County. And um, in 2017, as, as Danae mentioned, the advisory board um, requested the uh, county to consider increasing to the additional, the full $2. And the intent at that time was that the additional dollar would be dedicated to the uh, construction of a new uh, tourism focused facility. Um, and the county liked that idea, but we felt it's important to make sure that a facility is what we need. Um, so the Snohomish County Sports Commission, using a grant from the TPA, um, hired Hunden Strategic Partners from Chicago. And they did a, an assessment of our tourism portfolio in Snohomish County. And they discovered that we have great tourism and, and visitation during the summer months, so in order to best impact tourism, um, an indoor multi-event multi, uh, facility was what was really lacking. And so they recommended uh, up to 80,000 square feet of an indoor facility. Uh, with that recommendation in hand, the county went forward with the, the goal of dedicating that additional revenue directly to that construction. Uh, that's when uh, the county prosecuting attorney's office looked at the RCW and told us that they weren't sure we could do it that way. Uh, basically, the RCW allowing for TPAs is silent to whether it can be used for capital construction. Um, and the county didn't want to be the guinea pig and be the first one to use it in, in that way and find out partway into a bond that we weren't we shouldn't have done that. Uh, so we went back to our county level LTAC and the TPA advisory board, and we came up with a we came up with a, a, a 
plan that worked for everybody. Uh, staff, myself, did um, some research and we found out that other localities in the state with tourism promotion areas were actually funding their destination management and marketing efforts with TPA funds. And in the county, that came from lodging taxes currently. So the, the TPA advisory board has agreed um, once the increase has been implemented to begin funding those efforts from TPA funds. And that would free up money from the county's large fund, um, the 2% that we don't currently share with the city, um, to now then give a bond to build the facility that we are, uh, that we are hoping to build. Um, so just a, some quick background. Uh, additionally, as I mentioned, this will not impact the city of Bothell's uh, local lodging tax. Uh, speaking especially to you, Council Member Zorns, this will not uh, impact negatively your LTAC in any way. In fact, we as a county hope that you'll see some increase in your collection through additional room nights uh, that would come to the county as a result of, of this facility. Uh, there are three sites currently under evaluation uh, by the county, we have not finalized um, a site location. We do expect that to uh, occur during uh, the calendar year of 2020. I'll just finish my comments and open to your questions by saying that uh, there are nine cities in Snohomish County with TPA collecting hotels. All eight of them, uh, aside from Bothell, have approved uh, this agreement that we're asking you all to uh, ratify tonight. So you would be uh, the final that uh, would join us uh, on this journey, hopefully. All right, is there any questions? Councilmember Agnew. Where are the three sites? Uh, there, the two, there are two specific that I, can, that I can give, and I can give you the geographic location of a, of a third. Um, so the, the three sites under consideration are uh, Cavalero Hill County Park, uh, just across the trestle from Everett on uh, 20th in Lake Stevens, western end of, of Lake Stevens. Uh, that facility is already master planned for a building of up to 80,000 square feet, so it would be um, the quickest to construction if, if that uh, site is, is chosen. Uh, the, the, um, another is the Evergreen State Fairgrounds in Monroe. Um, the couple of concerns that the county has and we're, we'll be evaluating with that site is given the proximity to Woodenville, um, how much of the additional room nights that we would hope to capture from a facility like this would be lost to King County hotels. Uh, so that's something we'll have to evaluate as, as we consider uh, potential sites. The third is a, a site in South Everett. Um, it's owned by the city and it would be a, uh, a reuse of that facility. So I, I can't get into specifics of that one because the, the city has to go through their process. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Is there a motion? I move the recommended action. Second. Oh, there we go. Now we got questions. Here we go. Can you pull back here? Okay. Councilor Zerns. Oh, no, not. I thought you had a question. Oh, sorry, Councilor Olson. Uh, just some of the grants that you were speaking about. Yes, Could sir. you give a couple examples? Yes, absolutely. Um, so the TPA has a, a lot of the, a, a majority of the grants that the TPA gives um, have been sports related events. Uh, the TPA really likes uh, sports events because they're very trackable. The room nights are, are uh, very identifiable. Um, and they can also happen kind of countywide. Uh, conventions are, are really kind of set to either hotels or the arena in Everett, the convention center in Linwood. So a vast majority of the TPA grants are uh, sports events related. Spartan Race is one of the, the larger grants that they do each year. They underwrite the bid fee that that organization requires uh, to host an event locally. The TPA also um, fully funds the Snohomish County Sports Commission and their efforts to bring their operating budget and their efforts to bring um, events uh, locally. And then they, one of the other goals of that, uh, the advisory board is to also f um, encourage new events that you know, would start small and hopefully grow over their life in Snohomish County. And a great example of that one is um, the American Cornhole Organization. Uh, Beanbag Toss, for those of you that
that may not be aware, uh, they actually came to Everett last year um, in February for their, their first event. Uh, it was held in Everett at the indoor soccer arena, right in the middle of Snowmageddon. And I drove my Toyota Camry through the snow to get there to see that event. And they had great travel. They had folks from Colorado who probably came to came to snow and thought, yeah, this is <laughs> nothing new for us. Um, and they, uh, they had really great turnout. Um, and um, that's one that's coming back next year that the TPA will um, will continue to support. So they're, they have 15 projects approved for, for 2020, and they really run the gamut from small events all the way up to large events. My pleasure. Councilmember McNeil. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so it sounds to me like the, the 80,000 square foot facility will be just something that's rented out to clubs, programs, things like that? Yes, absolutely. So the, the facility, when it's built, the focus um, will be um, obviously tourism related events that will bring visitors to the county. Uh, th and thank you for the question. It gave me an opportunity to, to mention something that I, I forgot to during my presentation, which is uh, those type of events generally happen Friday through Sunday, Thursday through Sunday, uh, which means that this type of facility, which would have at a bare minimum eight basketball courts, which could double as 16 basketball courts in a sports configuration, would then be open, as you mentioned, council member, to local clubs, local sports organizations um, for their practices and, and games, not only Monday through Wednesday, but then on uh, weekends that aren't programmed. And we, we are projecting that it'll be programmed most weekends out of the year, but on the weekends that it's not, it would absolutely be available for local use. Fabulous, and do you know if King County has the same type of TPA? Uh, King County as a whole does not. There are three cities on the south end, um, SeaTac, Tequila, and what was the third one? SeaTac, Tequila, and what was the final one I just said here? Uh, uh, Des Moines. Des Moines, SeaTac, Tequila, and Des Moines came together. Um, they formed what's referred to as the Seattle Southside uh, TPA, and similar to what the county has done with each of the nine cities entered into an interlocal agreement, those three cities did that and, and formed a, a small regional TPA through interlocal agreements. Okay, and then the last question, you had mentioned that we would be the last Correct. Um, city, Snohomish County city to sign on. So all Snohomish County cities have signed on? Yes, uh, so the, the Snohomish County TPA, uh, the state law sets the minimum the, of 40 rooms. A hotel must have at least 40 rooms to be eligible to be assessed a, a TPA charge. When Snohomish County adopted the TPA ordinance at the request of our uh, tourism industry, uh, they actually set ours locally at 50 rooms. So there are nine cities in the county that have hotels, at least one hotel with 50 rooms or more. Um, all eight of them besides Bothell have approved this, this updated ILA so far. Fabulous, thank you. Thank you. I move the recommended action. Second. Moved by the deputy, I, I thought the city attorney said something. <laughs> I'm hearing things. Moved by the deputy mayor, uh, second by council member Agnew to uh, approve and authorize city manager to execute amendment number one to the interlocal agreement establish the tourism promotion area in Snohomish County. Is that the right one? Am I on the right one? Yes. Okay, good. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none? Yes. Oh, yes. So, excuse me, Councilmember McNeil. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I know you're uh, trying to get out of here, but come on now. Um, uh, I just wanted to say um, thank you uh, for all the work on the tourism piece um, for the city staff. Uh, but more importantly is the work that we do together regionally. Uh, doesn't matter what side of the line you're on, King County, Snohomish County, um, the partnership between Snohomish County and the city of Bothell, how important that is that we work together regionally um, and find opportunities uh, to make these type of spaces available to, uh, to our public. So I just wanted to thank you and I will be supporting the motion. Thank you very much. And if I can just add really quick in, in response, I can uh, speak on behalf of Tom and the Parks Department of Snohomish County that we agree with exactly what you said. And, and it, we've considered it a pleasure to work with Danae and, and Kelly and your team uh, in moving this forward. So uh, I return the sentiment as well. All right, any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, place your vote. Twice. 
We love our voting machine. There it goes. Uh, passes unanimously. We're on to new business, AB 19-222, interlocal agreement to create North King County Training Consortium with the City of Bothell Fire Department, Woodenville Fire and Rescue, North Shore Fire Department, and the Shoreline Fire Department. And I believe we have Chief Kroon. Kroon. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yep. Good evening, Council. So um, we are asking for your support of this ILA. I use the NAE's acronym, keep going with that. And just to give you a, um, a little more background uh, of what this is about, you have it in the packet there, but essentially what we're looking to do is formalize a joint training division between the, the four North County uh, departments, Shoreline, Woodenville, Bothell, and North Shore. And we work together collaboratively a lot, but this would formalize a, a local training consortium. And the reason we're trying to do this is to improve our training delivery and, and some efficiencies in training. Right now, we have four different departments with four really good training officers trying to deliver uh, basic mandatory training that we're required to do. And we're all doing it uh, to a basic degree pretty well, um, but we're doing it independently. So for instance, we have a we're all obligated to do a forcible entry class. So all four officers create their own in, in independent forcible entry class, try to get it on a crazy busy training schedule and get it scheduled uh, at, at different times of the year. So by form getting together and working collaboratively, uh, we can uh, reduce some of those duplication of efforts, right? We, we have uh, folks, um, instead of working being as generalists and working on all kinds of training development, we can get our training officers to work on two or three areas of expertise and become subject matter experts and that would lift up our training ability to give better training to our folks so they're not spread out so far they can focus on better training and i think that's going to be very helpful uh, just by way of background this is not the first time this is this is not a new idea in fact uh council member Regan is probably laughing over there but and we had one of these several years ago in the area but we think we've got a much better game plan going forward in this one uh, we are currently a member of EMTG, East Metro Training Group. You've probably heard of that. And essentially, that, that's another um, interlocal agreement uh, for combined training, but it's got a very limited focus. We just do multi-company operations. We have a, a best practices handbook, which kind of gives us a playbook for the first 10 minutes of a, of a situation. And then uh, we have Fire Academy, which has been very successful. But that ILA is quite limited in scope. And it really lacks, what it lacks is dedicated leadership from the top. And that's what this particular ILA is going to provide, is a dedicated leadership for this group to help us uh, shepherd through. And just by way, uh, Zone 3, I don't, wanna, I don't know acronyms, uh, this stuff's very interesting to me, but I'll tell you real quick. So King County, just so you know, is, is broken in for fire purposes into three zones. Zone 1 is Bellevue North, Zone 3 is Renton South, and Seattle is zone five, they're their own zone. And so zone three now, everything south of Renton has already, has through the last 10 years developed a training consortium. That's kind of what we're trying to do up here. And it's soup to nuts for training. They do everything for all of the departments in zone three as one training consortium that does all their training, academies, entry level, everything. And it's, it's very successful. Uh, and part of the reason they're doing that is because it is a training consortium and it's not department specific. So they have a, a firefighter in their training consortium who works for um, uh, Kent, say, or uh, Puget Sound, but they go deliver a class at SeaTac, but they're wearing a training consortium patch. They're not wearing a, a Puget Sound patch. So it's, it's seamless uh, training we get the, for those folks. And, and it's, it's been working out very well. And that's what we're gonna um, pattern that too. It's we're looking to do is to have this training division um, become its own uh, standalone entity we want to be very clear, we're not creating a new governmental an entity. Uh, with the exception of the training director, all the, all the employees or all the people of this group will still belong to their own departments. They'll still get a paycheck and they'll still get uh, um, evaluations from their home department, but they will uh, work together collaboratively through this training group. Uh, we'll have an oversight board of the four chiefs, then we'll have a, a operations board. We'll have the training director and the four deputy chiefs, and that way they'll, they'll get the training delivered down. Um, Shoreline has agreed already to be the agency of record. So if uh, run, we'll run the finances through Shoreline, they've agreed to do that. So that helps out for, for budgeting and finance uh, purposes. And then North Shore has some room at their station 51 to uh, house the training group, um, uh, to ha actually put them somewhere to, to work on. And, and just to let you know, we've, we've kind of started this already. It's been going about for a year. We've been kind of working on it. This just was not an overnight uh, decision on the training officers actually came up with a 2020 training calendar and it's actually kind of a work of art you got to see this thing it's it's amazing they have crammed 
everything we, we need to do, all our mandatory training onto a training calendar that coordinates all the training so it gets done and it's done systematically, not hodgepodge through the year. It's, it's, it's really, really hard to do, but they've already uh, accomplished that to date, so that's really cool. So what we're looking to is just uh, to formalize this uh, group, get us off and, and, and going, and so we can, uh, after the new year, uh, make this happen. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Chief. So um, as I'm reading through this, it, it sounds great, um, but I'm, I'm wondering, um, it talks about efficiencies and savings, but we're, we're talking about a potential $90,000 bill. So can you uh, explain how, how that works? And sure. Um, so I uh, want to be clear, um, you know, I, I'd love to say we're going we're gonna to save money. Um, probably not save money, but we're going to get a better use from our money. Uh, the, the fee that we may have to incur, it really depends on who we have assigned. So we, we've taken this like a business approach, and we have, we have included all the costs for this, this uh, ILA, for the consortium. So it's all the salaries, benefits, uh, supplies, maintenance, uh, rental, anything. We've, so if we, if we were to take this somewhere and, and plop it somewhere, we know how much it's going to cost. And then we've done a per capita assessment fee for everybody participating, and then that's your, uh, your total fee for the, for the consortium. You can offset those fees by providing in-kind services to the consortium. So what, what Bothell is going to offer uh, from the get-go is a training officer and an admin assistant. So that reduces our, um, uh, what we have to pay. Uh, we, have a, we also have a battalion chief, and, and part of the beauty is this, is that um, each department has the ability to offer services to this to the consortium, and the consortium will will um, pick uh, folks to be in the uh, in the leadership group. So there's one battalion chief spot uh, de determined for this group, and uh, I have a very good confidence that our battalion chief training battalion chief will be selected for this position, um, and that would offset all our costs for this upcoming year. If if he's not, then we would. Um, have to pay some fees. The, the, the one employee, the one that's unique, that's not uh, employed by anybody right now is the training director, and that's critically important. What we're trying to do there is get someone, a long-term employee, my, my vision, and I think the other chiefs too, to, to agree, is someone that's had a career in the fire service, is good at training, loves training, but has something they want to give back. Uh, so we would hire this person uh, as a as a career move, as the, you know, a, a place to stay, not a transitory thing, not a, not a cycle somebody through every couple of years, but someone that stays there to give us that long term uh, leadership in that role, and that's where the uh, the uh, extra money would come into play uh, potentially for us right now. So, um, whoever this person is, yeah. would that be their full job, and would so would the their salary be paid only by Bothell then? To that's offset the cost? That's what we're splitting up, right. So that person, we, we've got a, a wage and benefit package. They're trying to equate it to maybe a deputy chief. We're still working with that. Um, the idea is to, to make it attractive enough to get a person qualified to do the job that we, we would like to see in that position um, and to stick around for a while. Um, so I, yeah. I, that, that makes sense to me. I'm just trying to dial down onto the cost. So we hire somebody, it's a full-time position, is Bothell or is Bothell not paying their full salary? Well, we're, we're splitting it. We're going to split that's it. That's part of that, that per diem. Everything, everything is added in there, and then we've divided it up per capita, per firefighter in, who's participating. And so we're paying a share. So um, um, I couldn't tell you the percentage, but say Bothell's percentage is 27% of this salary and benefits for that, that one position. I guess I'm com confused because you said that it would offset our, our, our portion. So, depending but it sounds like we're people, splitting it depending out. Depending on what we offer <laughs> to the consortium. So right now we are going to offer the training officer and an admin assistant, and those two positions offset most of our costs. So are those two people full time, and will they? Yes. It and we obviously pay their full salary, but that's only a piece of their hours, correct? Uh, or so, what portion of their time? time they, yeah, they, most of their time would be spent with the consortium but they okay. would probably have some time to do bottle specific things if they needed to. So <laughs> so then it sounds like it would be more than 90,000. That's what I'm confused about. 
if we're paying two people? Well, we're already paying, we're paying for them to work for, for Bothell specific. Now we're gonna use them in the training consortium and, and use our training officer to become a SME in, in some subjects. So we're gonna, we're not gonna, that's not gonna increase the costs. Chief, will you yield the floor and let the city manager step sure. in for a second? Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm, maybe my questions aren't clear, I'm sorry. No, I think what the deputy mayor is asking is, what is the total cost to Bothell, regardless of any in-kind in contribution? Do you have that original? So if we were not to um, offer the training officer, not offer the administrative uh, support, and not offer the battalion chief, what is that cost? And and. And then it's offset, so so let's say it's hypothetically $300,000. So then we put in the administrative analyst or the administrative assistant, so then it's cut down by 60. And then we offer the training officer, so it's cut down by another 100. And then this remaining amount, and so we potentially cut that down by having the battalion chief be the one selected for the first year. And that neutralizes the cost. In following years, when a different battalion chief is in place, there will then be a direct cost, and we think that's up to about $80,000. The executive director that you're, or the executive trainer, or whatever his the training director, that's included in that, that cost. So the battalion chief and the trainer are two different people. So I think that's where there's some confusion, but I don't know if we know. Do you know the, the, the total cost with no in-kind contribution, what the cost is that's allocated to Bothell? Um, I believe the figure I have here is $382,219. Okay, so that's the cost before we start getting discounts for Correct. our contributions. Correct. So um, what portion of that are we already spending on training? It sounds like this, is this an expansion of training or is this a replacement of training or a little bit of both? Um, to some degree expansion, it's, it's, it's bringing it to a higher level. Because we are, we are doing what's mandated by law, basic stuff right now, um, but we're really spinning a lot of our wheels and we're, we're, we're all doing things independently. This, this way will able, enable us to do, perform or to uh, deliver better, higher quality training and have our folks, our trainers focus on specific training and get better at it and able to deliver that so we so we can uh, perform better in the field. That's what it's all about. When we go try to be safer when we're doing our jobs, if we if we work together more collaboratively and train together, we know what we're doing, um, there's less chance of getting somebody hurt, of, of getting and mitigating a situation quicker um, down the road. Okay, so it sounds like it's an expansion of training. And so I, I guess what I'm trying to dial down to is, if it's 380 something, what, are we're already spending a certain amount of money on training, so it's not really 384 or whatever it is, right? That's it's, correct. it's less. The individual, so that's where the in kind cost comes from. The administrative assistant is already supporting the training program. That's what I was trying to get. The training Thank officer you. is already the training officer, and then there's the battalion chief. So we already have. We're already spending that money on those people. Correct. Correct. Okay. And now they're just being combined into this consortium. Okay, thank you. That's much clearer to me. I appreciate that. Thank you. I should have said that. <laughs> she's the council whisperer. That's why she's sitting up there in the front. Uh, Councilmember Agnew? Oh, you want somebody else to go? Just a quick already. clarifying question. So we're taking people who are doing the, tra the training coordinating now, and we're expanding or we're adding to what they're doing? Yeah, actually, we're taking stuff off their plate because um, right now, our uh, well, the training officer has to deliver all our basic training for Bothell. He or she is responsible for that. This way, when we have all the training officers together, they'll deliver all of that training, but together so they can limit to what each individual is doing. So instead of having to be a generalist in, say, 15 different areas, they can focus on three or four and get really good at that and have the other folks take care of the other areas. So I guess my question is the other folks taking care of the other areas, are those other folks staff we already currently have? Well, it's other departments. Yeah, all our, all our departments have training divisions. They just have a different level of, they may have three people or four people assigned, it's, but they all have a training division. We're all doing kind of the same thing. Okay, so we won't be hi hiring people. If we contribute staff to the new consortium, right. we won't be hiring people to replace them. No, 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 what they're no, doing no, they're doing their same, essentially the same job, just they're, they'll be housed 
together more often right, and doing that, things together. Okay, that's what I needed yeah, to yeah, know. Yeah, we're not thank adding you. any position staff positions. Okay, thank you. Councilman Ragney. I don't have a whole lot of questions. Uh, I, I think it's a great idea. I think it worked relatively well the last time we had it. Uh, their got, personalities got involved and that's how it was uh, taken away. I think these four entities work the most together of anyone in zone one. So it's imperative that we all have the same training. Basically Bothell's taking their training staff and sending them in to the consortium. So that'll decrease us dramatically. It'll also decrease their workload. Instead of our training staff having to do ventilation, confined space, trench rescue, extrication, you know, operations, uh, rescue, that kind of stuff, they can kind of go and say, well, you know, my forte is really trench. And then they'll teach everybody in this zone up here trench and they'll get much better at it. And everybody in this zone will get much better at it. You know, uh, firefighting is an inherently dangerous job and you, you get better by two things, experience or training. And you gotta have training because those new guys coming in don't have the experience. You know, I totally support this thing. I, I think it's the wave of the future. Uh, I, I think we will reap huge benefits from this. Uh, maybe not initially, but definitely down the road. We will reap huge benefits from this. I do support it wholeheartedly. Any other questions or are we ready for a motion? Councilor Agnew, would you like to make the motion? I approve, uh, recommended action is approve the interlocal agreement for the creation of the North King County Training Consortium with the City of Bothell Fire Department, Woodenville Fire and Rescue, and North Shore and Shoreline Fire Departments and direct the city manager to execute the agreement as presented. I'll second it. So it's moved by Councilman Ragnew, seconded by the mayor to approve the interlocal agreement between, blah, blah, blah. Okay, maybe well, we already read it. <laughs> Any discussion on the motion? <laughs> Seeing none, place your vote. And it passes unanimously. Moving right along. The riv most riveting topic on the agenda is, where is it? There it is, AB 19-223, the Salary Commission Ordinance. And we have Mr. Pruitt. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and City Councils. I'm here for the purpose of discussing with you the evening an update to Chapter 2.92, which establishes uh, a Salary Commission to review and update City Council compensation. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the background of the Salary Commission for, for those of you who may not know. Um, a little bit of the work of the two, what the 2019 Salary Commission did and then some recommended changes they have um, to update the ordinance. Um, the Salary Commission is basically born out of state law. Um, the legislature passed a law that said that city governments can set by ordinance a Salary Commission. Um, those Salary Commissions have to contain, the membership has to contain residents of the city. They're appointed by the mayor, which has got to be approved by the council. Uh, can include city employees, elected officials, or family members of either of those. Um, they can increase or decrease salary, city council compensation or they can take no action. Um, and their decisions um, are not basically subject to change unless there is a voter referendum to do so, uh, meaning we could actually vote on um, council compensation here in Bothell if that process um, occurred. Uh, the council did that, uh, adopted an ordinance in 2009. In, in the ordinance that um, is now chapter 2.92, um, salary commissioner, there has to be three salary commissioners. Their term can last as long as their work essentially. Um, they're appointed every five years, but basically the way the ordinance, the way that the chapter reads is that once their work is done, their term is over. Um, they vote by majority rule um, and all their meetings are open to the public and they have to have a public hearing before making a final um, a change to council compensation. Uh, this year, the salary commission met after the mayor um, appointed and you approved um, the three members. They looked at comparable data in cities and um, made a recommendation and did change council compensation and had that public hearing before they did so. Um, and then they 
took an additional step that is unique in the sense that they are recommending these changes to the code tonight. Um, and the changes have to do with the deputy mayor position, um, um, how often they meet, and then the length of their terms. And I'll talk about that a little more in a second. Um, they asked me to look at information outside of salaries and benefits for council members this past year. Uh, they looked at essentially cost of living adjustment at what cities provide cost of living adjustments to council members. They looked at how often other salary commissions meet and the length of term, and they found essentially that most other cities don't uh, provide a cost of living adjustment for council members. Um, Bothell's city salary commission meets more, le way less often than other cities, and then um, also the length of term, um, the average for other cities was four years. So there's a lot of, sorry, there's a lot of um, cleanup and in the proposed proposal that you have in your packets this evening, um, items that don't really change the intent of the or ordinance, but there are three main policy questions. Uh, the first one is should the deputy mayor position be added as a separate position to chapter 2.92? Uh, this was an unexpected conversation during the salary commission discussion this year. Uh, the commission believed that they did not have the legal authority to have the deputy mayor be a separate position on the salary table and after talking with the city attorney, um, they basically ma made the deputy mayor position equal to other council members. However, they wanted the authority to do that. They believe the deputy mayor has dis distinctive duties from the rest of the council and that there should be a separate position um, and that's in line with what other cities do as well. Second qu qu uh, question is about uh, how often they meet they are proposing to meet every two years. Um, again, um, this is in line with what other cities were doing for the most part. They had a large discussion about COLA versus meeting more often. Instead of doing a cost of living adjustment, they felt the best thing to do was for them to meet on a more regular basis. And they were concerned about um, council salaries in line with lines with things that are going on with the city financially and the budget. and meeting every two years would allow them meet, to meet during the same years that the budget is being developed. They also talked about the impact on staff in regards to this change, meaning the city clerk and I will have to deal with this every two years instead of every five years. But there are some efficiencies with that as well in the sense of that part of what we're doing every five years is figuring out what happened five years ago and how we're, we have to do all this all over again. So doing it on a more regular basis might be helpful in that regard. Um, in regards to commission terms, they're proposing that we change the um, chapter 2.92 to reflect that they serve two four-year staggered terms. They thought this worked well with the previous recommendation. Every commissioner would basically have two, two, two times uh, to do the process during their um, term. Uh, they also thought this provided continuity uh, the three commissioners this year felt like having somebody that had been through the process on the commission before would have been uh, helpful. And again, it's more in line with what, what other cities are doing. That's all I have for you this evening. Are there any questions? I told you they would be riveted. I was into expecting it. So. Uh, let's see, adopt. Oh, there's a question. Council members are so, Just a brief question. Are we hard and fast with three people on this? I'm just thinking of staggering. It kind of makes it. No. Um, I don't. Or believe, does that put too, too that. many cooks in the kitchen? To be honest with you, I have not thought about that at all. Um, uh, there's no requirement in the state law that it has to be three that I know of. You could certainly do more. I would say that this year I thought the three worked well. They worked really well together. They were efficient, and I thought they were engaged and wanted to do the right thing. Do you think, I, I like the idea of staggering. Do you think we could have a, we would get the impact that we want staggering with three people? Um, yeah, so, I, I think so, okay. in the sense of at least one of the commissioners every time would, would have had experience before. Okay. Yeah, okay. I think so. All right, thank you. Yeah. Any other discussion? Is there a motion? Move the recommended action. It's moved second. by Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councilmember McNeil to adopt the ordinance as presented. 
Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, place your vote. That passes unanimously. We're on to AB 19-224, amendment of Bothell Municipal Code Table 20.02.155A, retroactive fee corrections for the 2018-2019. It just stops right there. Must be the city attorney. Yours, yours yeah, there. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, that's mine. Um, so if you turn your attention to page 415 of the packet, uh, that's where this agenda bill begins. And actually what I'd like to do is if you could um, scroll up about three pages to the prior ordinance regarding the salary commission. Um, if you want to look at, for example, page 410 um, and just look at the begin at the top of that page when it says section two, um, and it reads section 2.92020 of the Baltimore Municipal Code is hereby amended as follows. And then it goes to 292020. Uh, and as you'll see, there are certain letters or uh, phrases that are in strike through and other letters and phrases that are underlined. And one thing we do with any ordinance is we try to show what the legislative intent is by putting new additions in underlined and strike throughs through the um, information that we'd like to remove. Um, and the reason I'm here today talking about this topic is that we are humans and we have made an, we have made an error. Um, so back in 2017, when we made amendments to our code, we um, restructured how it looked. And as we were doing the restructuring and the cutting and pasting, there were simply portions that were in there prior that were inadvertently removed. Uh, they were never removed with the strike through process. Um, and so when we, so staff had continued to uh, assess those fees as if they were still in code, again, because there was no legislative intent to remove those. But when we did, once we did catch the Scrivener's error that they were inadvertently removed, uh, that, that was the impetus for this action tonight. So the city is recommending two actions. First is to adopt the um, attached ordinance that ratifies the collection of the plan review fees for the past few years. Again, that language was inadvertently removed, was not done subject to legislative action or legislative intent. Um, and then second, to adapt the, the second attached ordinance that revises BMC 2002-115A, where it adds back in the language, again, that was inadvertently removed, it just so there's no, um, just for greater clarity moving forward and I'm happy to entertain any questions. Deputy Mayor. So um, I'm looking at page 422, mm -hmm. um, seven and eight in the chart, and I'm, I'm puzzled by the change of language. I just wondered if you could expand on that a little bit. We have a... Uh, Dave Swayze here to answer the technical questions. On, on page. So it says uh, we're crossing out, striking through use of outside consultants for plan checking or inspections, uh, actual cost, and then it says mobile home replacement installation. And then uh, in eight, use of outside consultants for plan checking or inspections, actual cost, and then moved buildings, pre-move inspection. I guess I don't I don't understand because it didn't seem like that was language that was in the summary. There there were uh, three items in uh, when when we changed the fees uh, when that went to code publishing they added the consultant fee three times. And oh, I noticed that. Yes. And so what those what two of those were supposed to be were for the mobile home replacement and then for. Uh, uh, the, the other fee that, that you mentioned also. Okay, so we're back to what we wanted and striking out. Exactly. There, okay. Yep. I just, I didn't recognize the language from the summary, so that was it, thank okay. you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Is there a motion? I move that we adopt the attached ordinance ratifying collection of plans review fees and adopt the attached ordinance revising BMC 20.02.155A. I'll second it. It's my last vote as a council member. <laughs> Moved by the deputy mayor, seconded by the mayor to adopt the attached ordinance ratifying collection of the plan review fees, adopt the, and adopt the attached ordinance revising BMC 20.02.155A. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, place your vote.
And that passes unanimously. We're on to AB 19-225, quarterly financial and levy update, third quarter 2019. Is it Jorger? How, how do you say that? Yeah, that's right. Jorger. Jorger. Okay. Miss Jorger. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Carly Jorger, and I'm the Public Safety Levy Coordinator here to bring you the quarter three updates for the Safe and Secure Bothell Public Safety Levy and the Fire Station Replacements Project. Last one. Since I last saw you for the second quarter update in mid-September, our levy implementation team has continued to meet every two weeks to track our progress. And it's thank to, thanks to this team that I can bring you tonight's updates on our new hires, new services, and uh, delays to two services. So in the third quarter, the police department hired four police officers, one crime analyst, one police support officer, and the public works department hired uh, the building maintenance specialist. With these new seven hires, that uh, brings our total count up to 18 of the 27 levy funded positions filled. Uh, during this time period, we were also able to implement three of the new levy funded services. Uh, pictured here on the left is Nate Veely. He is the Public Works Department's uh, building maintenance specialist. And his role is to maintain our current public safety buildings and will play an important role in preserving and maintaining our new fire st stations once they're built. In the meantime, his help is freeing up time for our fleet and facilities manager, Jeff Sperry, to lead the fire station replacements project. Uh, pictured in the center, we have Crystal McGuinn, the police department's newest police support officer. Her role is to transport in custodies from the jail to the court. Uh, she, alongside two other police support officers, help keep our patrol officers on the roads instead of tied up uh, with transports. And lastly on the right, we have Sarah Stein, the police department's new crime analyst. Her role supports the department's strategy to move towards a data-driven response method. So she uses crime data to identify Bothell's hotspots so the department can send officers to the right place at the right time. Also in quarter three, our levy team chose to delay implementation of two services. The police department now projects that uh, they will be able to fill the property coordinator by the end of the first quarter of next year and the community engagement quarter by the end of the second quarter of next year. And this graph in front of you shows these changes um, in the context of our uh, project timeline. The, there's a few reasons for these delays. Uh, the property coordinator uh, has been delayed because of a need to backfill the selected candidate's current job within the police department. And the community engagement coordinator has been delayed because of um, the department's rigorous background investigation process. And moving into the fire stations piece of safe and secure. Uh, in the third quarter, our fire station team continued to meet and advance the procurement process to select the design build team that will work on the stations. They received eight statements of qualifications, uh, shortlisted four to receive the re request for proposals. These were scored and BN Builders Miller Hole Partnership came out on top. The team wrapped up the third quarter by uh, negotiating a contract that um, you all, City Council approved on November 12th. So to summarize, both our levy and fire station teams have continued to meet and track our progress against our project plans and making adjustments as we go. And me and the whole team are here to take your questions. Thank you. Is there any questions? All right. Riveting. Thank you. Yeah, good presentation. Um, Last on the agenda is council conversations. Is there any? Oh, may we have a third quarter financial update for you too. 
Oh, how rude of me. I already, <laughs> so I already shut down my computer, so. <laughs> All right, Director Bothwell, you have the floor. Okay. Is there a agenda item for that? It's on the same uh, AB. Oh, it's the same it one. I'm sorry. <laughs> that, you tricked me. That's why. Yeah. All right, go ahead. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to start with updates since the last quarterly report. Uh, the first notable trend that we reported in the second quarter was that sales tax was slumping a little bit. Uh, the sales tax underperformance at that time was reported as about 3 to 5 percent below budget. Uh, it's important to note that sales tax collections are actually up from last year by about 4 percent. Uh, they're just not meeting the projections that were used in the budget. Um, another one is telephone utility tax, and we talked a lot about that in the second quarter. Um, people's moves away, moving away from telephones is causing the utility tax to, uh, for telephones to slump, and that has continued also in the third quarter. Um, the other notable item that we had in the second quarter was that general fund expenditures uh, were under budgeted amounts, and that trend has also continued. So departments continued to exercise good budget discipline and find savings where they could. Uh, and so we're trending below budget uh, on general fund expenditures, and we expect that trend to continue through the end of the year as well. Um, real estate excise tax was another theme in the second quarter update and the first quarter update. Uh, in the first quarter, we said real estate excise tax is, is blowing up. Uh, we're getting a lot. Second quarter, it slowed down a little bit, and in the third quarter, it's really kind of slumped. So it looks like we're on track to hit budget uh, for real estate excise tax, but the good news that we had in the first quarter has just not continued. And then finally, the, the bright spot has been ground uh, emergency medical transport, the GEMT revenue. Uh, I reported before that we were uh, collecting amounts from prior periods, so we are all caught up now. And in the third quarter, we got another approximately $600,000 uh, from that new unbudgeted revenue source, uh, and that will continue. Uh, so updates since the last report, excuse me. Uh, new and notable are one-time items uh, that happened in Q3. Uh, so the finance team got together with the fire team and they did some uh, forecasting of the new GEMT revenue as it is an ongoing revenue source. Uh, and they determined that that will be uh, a new revenue source in the amount of about $500,000 to $600,000 a year. Uh, as I mentioned, it's unbudgeted, so that's a positive for the general fund. Um, we did have kind of a negative event, but it's a one-time event in the third quarter, and that was a sales tax refund. The Department of Revenue uh, refunded one of our taxpayers. Um, I made a significant refund to them, and our portion of that that we had to give back was about $300,000. So that's negatively impacting sales tax collections in the uh, third quarter. We, of course, remove that when we look at the trend for sales tax, but um, that's the negative development in the third quarter. And then cable utility tax looks like it's sliding just a little bit, and this is something we just wanted to put on your radar. It's not a significant amount yet, but it looks like it could become a trend um, just based primarily on consumer behavior. So it's something we're keeping an eye on. Um, so overall, revenues appear to be cooling off a little bit, but departments are doing a good job of controlling costs. Uh, so while the results at the end of the third quarter did not demonstrate a positive trend, we are expecting to end the year with better than budgeted uh, results. So we added to the deficit a little bit, but we're expecting to end the year better than we had budgeted. So it's a positive. Uh, really quickly on other matters, we've got the economic update, which I provide every time. Um, it's not, it hasn't changed much. Uh, it appears that there is a, some of the leading indicators are suggesting that there is a, uh, a recession coming. Um, but a lot of economists has kind of softened that message and said maybe it's just a period of slow growth that's coming. So we really don't know. Um, we're not expecting any kind of market expansion. Um, but we'll keep an eye on it. We'll continue to report to you. It's something that we're thinking a lot about and uh, doing a lot of research on just in anticipation of the budget next year. Um, and the lackluster third quarter financial results are compounding concerns that the long-term financial sustainability of the city. Um, and this is just a reminder that that topic is going to be front and center as we go into the next budget cycle. So that's your report for the third quarter. I'm happy to take any questions. Council Member Agnew. Uh, it's not a question, it's just a comment. Uh, on the transportation fees that we c collect, there's some legislation that's going on that's going to decrease that dramatically in the future. So just a heads up on that. <coughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Comments? Last but not least, safe streets and sidewalks update. So you have your third quarter update in your packet, and I am here to answer any questions. I love it. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> any questions from anybody? Councilmember McAuliffe? 
Thank you. I just have a comment, and that is that I'm watching the work on 180th um, and 80. I'm sorry, 88th Avenue up in West Hill, and that is an amazing feat to put a sidewalk in there. But I want to compliment you. That's got to be a really um, enormous challenge, and the people are doing it, so I'm very pleased. Thank you. It's my street. <laughs> Deputy Mayor. I concur, and I think the mayor should have put that on his accomplishment list because <laughs> that was something that was asked for the prior to even getting on council. So that's a really big accomplishment. Nice work, thanks. I think that was asked for before it was even annexed, wasn't it? <laughs> I was here when that happened. Uh, any other questions on safe streets? All right, we're done with that agenda item. Now we're on to council conversations. <laughs> any conversing needed? Well, I just want to do a little update. Sorry, I wasn't here early enough to do that, but I wanted to update you a little bit on the pros plan because I attended the uh, park, park Board meeting uh, in December, and I want to just say we have 400 acres of parks and open space. We have 26 parks, nine sports fields, and miles of trade. And I want you to know the pros plan really reflects what the community values and, and what they want to see moving forward. So I want to compliment um, Nick Strope and your staff for doing an enormous job of collecting community concerns and their responses. And we will have more in the future. But I think we should really value the fact that we have this much open space and parks available to our community. So that was my little short report. Any more conversing? All right, wish Good you guys. luck. Yeah, wish you guys all the best of luck. I might watch from home every once in a while. We'll see. Right. <laughs> all right, is there a motion? I would like to make a, a motion to adjourn. Second. And I'd like to speak to my motion. Councilor McNeil. Um, I just want to say one thing to you, Mayor. You left it better than when you got here. So thank you. Thank you. I'll miss you guys. Any other discussion on the motion? See none. Place your vote. Sorry. Um, we are adjourned with five in the affirmative, two that didn't vote. <laughs>